Hello and welcome to Doc to Me. My name is Heather. And I'm Kathleen. And this week we are covering In the Deep, the submarine murder case on Netflix. Before we get into that, you can follow us on Twitter and or join our Facebook group. Info for that can be found in the show notes. If you would like to email us comments or suggestions or donate to us at our PayPal, our email address is doctobepod at gmail.com. We appreciate any help, whether it's a way we can make this podcast better or just a dollar. Can you give 50 cents? I think 50 cents would even 50 make 50 cents happy. is fine, yeah. <laughs> you can tell a crime is bizarre if it happens in another country and we hear about it in the U.S. Because we got enough shit going on here. Yeah, I mean, fuck, Florida is like single-handedly taking up the newspaper florida alone yeah it's really got to be over the top for us to pay attention also just so we're clear neither one of us speaks danish so i will try my best wish i did (laughs) the backstory to this documentary is odd did you look into it i did not okay i like to be surprised (laughs) the director emma sullivan contacted peter madsen to do a film on him because he's this kind of big deal in Denmark as this inventor who built his own submarines and is working on building his own rocket to go to space. And he's doing all this research and the work with basically just donations. Honestly, when I, when it first started, I was like, this is kind of like Mythbusters. Like they're just (laughs) like building weird shit in like some kind of warehouse. Like, okay. So that's how the film idea initially started was just following him around until things just went off the rails. (laughs) Yeah. Like, Shit was, got dark. It was supposed to premiere on Netflix in May 2020, but after it premiered at Sundance Film Festival, two subjects and the main cinematographer protested the film in the press. And so Netflix pushed it under the rug until they quietly released it on September 30th, 2022. And this is not the original edit of the film. It says they edited the two people, but I could only one. I like I how you notice. told me to watch it sober, and so yes. then I watched it sober and. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it really weird when their interviews are shown because it's this weird AI face. Right, they've like digitally altered. It's like the in uh, Twilight when like like the weird baby's face when they like, change the baby's fu- face of future movies, I guess, or something like that. Yeah, because when I saw it, I was like, the baby face looks normal. I don't know what anybody's talking about. And then I looked online, I was like, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were like, we really fucked up with that baby, (laughs) so let's go back and fix it. So yeah, in this film, it's slightly unnerving. Like, the faces are melting. Yeah, it's kind of like waxy, faint blobbiness around them. Yeah, I wish I had been sober, because it was... (laughs) It didn't make me feel good. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> was it a bit like, trippy like when we went through that uh alien yeah <laughs> it's like it, it's just I which guess, by the way valley you're like yeah it looks like a human face but there's something off which by the way my father-in-law was asking about how new mexico went and like i couldn't tell him we didn't just go for the aliens we went for other reasons <laughs> and then i was talking the about the rock shop yeah the, uh, the rock yeah i was i was the rocks were amazing um, and I was talking about the alien thing or whatever, and I was like, it's four dollars, and you can go back like any time. Or I like, think it's something like four dollars, but anyway, it was five. oh okay, <laughs> still super cheap, and you can go back as many times as you want in a day. Yeah. And I was like, we went twice. <laughs> like there was a reason. Thursday, August tenth, twenty seventeen. It's crazy. It was five years ago. Swedish journalist Kim Val joins Danish. Danish. Fuck me. Danish inventor Peter Madsen for a trip on his amateur-built submarine, the UC-3 Nautilus. Which you couldn't pay me enough to go on some dude's backyard-built submarine. Man-made submarines are not that ridiculous if you know anything about cartels and drug smuggling. Look into it. It's amazing. They just build them in the jungle. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. I'm just going to say old people are so concerned about building a wall at the border because that's where the drugs are coming in. We need an underwater net. They need to be concerned about the ocean. Um, Homeland Security estimates that submarines carry one third of smuggled maritime goods to the United States. So what I'm hearing is that submarine pirates should be a thing. (laughs) Because the cartels build them in the jungles and then they launch them off. And then they have, you know, people who have fishing boats will come and meet them to get the drugs, take them back to the U.S. Holy shit! (laughs) Yes. 
Dude, these people are enterprising. So that's all just to say, like, man-made submarines are not rare. This one is just more professional and not slapped together in the jungles of Colombia. Although when you look at the inside, it is not professional. (laughs) It's like the equivalent of, you know, some dude taking you out on his dad's boat. Like, (laughs) it's just, it's not fancy. It's the implication. (laughs) There was a lot of Dennis going on in this. So back to the story, Kim Val and her partner, Ulu, I think they pronounced it, Stobe, were preparing to host a farewell party in Refshalun, which I believe is a harbor town of Copenhagen. I was surprised that she skipped out on her farewell party or whatever, like her going away party to go get the story or whatever. I would have been like kind of pissed off as a friend if I was throwing a party for someone. Well, it was, I'll I'll get to it, but... um... They were planning to move to Beijing in a few days, so that's why they were having the party. Before the party, Kim received a text from Peter inviting her to board his submarine. That is not an innuendo. She agreed to join him because she had tried to get an interview with him previously several times, but she only agreed to spend two hours with him. Maybe they were going to try to have the party afterwards. I'm not sure. That makes more sense. I, I don't know. Speculation. So she boards at 7 p.m., and when the submarine doesn't return to the harbor, Kim's boyfriend calls the police at 1.43 a.m. It has been quite some time. Yeah, to report the disappearance, but you can't really do much during the middle of the night, so it seems the Coast Guard waited until sunrise to get everybody looking. Friday morning at 10.14 a.m., it is spotted from Drogden Lighthouse, south of where they originated, And we see how excited Peter's friends are in the documentary to know that he's okay. But that changes rather quickly. Right. It kind of reminded me of my dad when I got in a car accident or whatever. He's, you know, I mean, I'm I'm really glad you're okay. But the car is destroyed. (laughs) I'm glad you're okay. But the car. (laughs) Because you know you're fucked for at least the next hour dealing with insurance. Yeah. He was just, you know, and they they were upset about the submarine. Like, (laughs) it's damaged. It's sunk. Kathleen just pissed herself. I did. I'm very, <laughs> very loud, Peter. I was joking when we said we got to finish that bottle. <laughs> so good. It's dangerous. <laughs> the submarine is sinking, but luckily they are able to rescue Peter, who says that Kim is on the shore safe. He had dropped her off at a restaurant in or near Refshaloon at 11.30 the previous night. He just dropped her off from his submarine. That's also way past the two-hour mark, too. All of the friends who had just been cheering about Peter being rescued immediately shift to where is this woman and why hasn't she contacted her boyfriend or family? Right away, they're concerned about her and see holes in Peter's story. Right. If he dropped her off, why didn't she reach out to her boyfriend? Yeah. The news interviews Peter right after his rescue, and he's just so broken up about his little submarine sinking and mentions that he was the only one on board. Just no concern whatsoever about Kim being missing. He's more concerned about his submarine. Yeah, like, bro, you were the last to see her. So, yeah, he's immediately taken in for questioning. And then we go to clips of what this was originally supposed to be, like Peter hanging out with friends, soldering parts, and just blowing shit up. And being really weird. (laughs) I'm just going to say that up front. Like, he's really weird in this documentary. August 12th, Peter appears before a pretrial custody hearing where he faces preliminary manslaughter charges. I guess in Denmark, you acknowledge what someone is going to be charged with before you formally do it. His story to the police at this point is now there was a terrible accident on board. Kim was hit in the head by the submarine's hatch and he had dumped her body somewhere in the bay. Which is a weird thing to do in an accident. (laughs) Like... If it's an accident... You generally just call 911 or the equivalent for, you know... (laughs) I was going to say Swedish, but isn't she Swedish? She's Swedish. Yeah. (laughs) On the 13th, the submarine is raised, brought to shore, and Kim is not found inside. His friends at this point don't want to think Peter has, like, straight up murdered Kim, so they're trying to put forth theories, like maybe she fell overboard and he didn't have a way to call for help. But they really do seem very concerned about Kim and finding Kim and hoping that she's alive. Normally, you'd expect them to just say, there's no way he did something. She's fine. But they're like, no, something clearly is wrong. Yeah, it's it's definitely from the very beginning. It's okay, but why didn't she reach out? Yeah. Like, what's going on here? 
It's like they accept that something might have actually happened. Like, they're not just defending him wholeheartedly. This film is really bad about the thing I hate most about in documentaries, going back and forth on the timeline. I actually, when I watched it, I wondered why they didn't just show all the footage in order, because it would have been a progression to, like, what we end with, but... Yeah, the back and forth was definitely very confusing because in a lot of cases you couldn't even tell that it was necessarily a previous. Yeah, it would have been better if they just went in a linear timeline of starting off with what this film was originally going to be and then slowly inching into the story that we know. But I'm not a professional film critic, so what do I know? Basically, Peter's backstory is he and a partner started a company called Copenhagen Suborbitals in 2008. He basically built the launch system, launch pad, and booster rocket engines, but was told he would have nothing to do with the actual launching of the rocket. So he left the company in 2014 to start his own company. Right next door. Rocket Madsen Space Laboratory, which is where the clips mentioned earlier were filmed. And he went the total douche route of having this lab in the same parking lot. It is literally right next to the other company. How would you want your competitors to be like right next to you? And they're, it's not like they're hiding in labs building this shit. They're no, outdoors. In the lot. Yeah, like, like they're going to see all of your trade secret. What the hell, man? The restaurant that Peter says he dropped Kim off at is covered in CCTV. So if he had dropped her off there, it would have been on film. It's not every day you see someone get out of a submarine. (laughs) And of course, the police find no such footage of Kim. Even if he had dropped her off at the harbor, it would have been a five-minute walk back to her home. How would she have gotten lost? Maybe she's like me. Just like no sense of direction to get lost. (laughs) But that's pretty bad. And then it's discovered that the submarine was deliberately sunk. I feel so bad for his friends in this. Right. All their hard work and their money and their And just that they want to believe hours. this guy, but they know stuff isn't adding up. And Yeah, it's just kind of like, what the fuck? Stefan, the friend who is interviewed a lot in this, goes to check out the submarine and sees right away that the valves are open and it was intentionally sunk by Peter. It's just seeing him go through the realization of, oh shit, he did something bad. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very obvious. And then his friends find out about his newest story and can't figure out why, if it had been an accident, he would dump her body at sea. So at this point, they know Kim is dead and that her body has to be in the bay, so that's where the search turns. On August 21st, her torso was found by a poor cyclist on the shores of Clydesoon, south of Copenhagen. Which just sounds so majestic. Yeah. And then there's a woman's torso. You're just trying to bicycle through the countryside and just a beautiful dead body. scenic bike ride. Her arms, legs, and head had been removed, quote, as a result of deliberate cutting. Which, again, if someone has an accident, you don't generally just bury them at sea <laughs> by also cutting their body up into smaller pieces and he had attached metal to the torso in hopes it would sink again <laughs> not the best well thought yeah, out like it doesn't really oops. sound like what you would do again his poor friends i really want to hug them just seeing them figure out that this guy who they love and spent so much time with is a monster The one guy, Stefan, who said i want to believe it was still an accident but the fi- facts are right there in front of us like, yeah. Like, why would he bury her at sea? That doesn't make any sense. You're not like a pirate out <laughs> on like some adventure in the open waters. Like, and then the other guy who was really taking it hard. He's been in my house. We were at a birthday celebration on Saturday, and then he goes and does this on Thursday. Oh God. It's just not often we get a firsthand look at like how the killer's friends and loved ones react. Right, like literally as it's happening. Yeah. On August 25th, Peter faces preliminary charges of indecent handling of a corpse. Which apparently you only get six months of time in prison for like chopping up a body. Well, because they So I just have to say, you can definitely dismember someone. You just need to make sure that you just happen upon their dead body (laughs) first. They still don't have absolute proof he killed her on purpose, but you definitely can't cut up a body. Some of his friends are gathered together saying it doesn't make sense how the hatch could have just slipped and hit Kim in the head. 
and also someone reported seeing him take a saw out of this out to the submarine beforehand which you don't generally need a wood saw on a metal submarine no. And also how he would only offer to take women out on the submarine and that he had planned to take the AI girl out that night instead of Kim, which is terrifying. Because of implications. I had no idea about that part. I know. And I honestly, like I was telling you, I can see why she didn't want to be in it because holy fuck, she was definitely his next intended or his intended victim. And then the, you know, Kim only died because she happened to get to him first on the submarine yeah like this man had a plan yes somebody was gonna die (laughs) they play a clip where he jokingly threatens to hack the director to death he then says she misheard him and he said hug but i rewinded that a lot no he definitely in the way he was talking he was like oh you don't hug with a hammer or something like that like he said hack fucking psycho he Definitely. And even the woman that was next to him kind of gave off vibes like she was the hell. This is really kind of weird. I don't know why you're saying that. Towards the end where he was just going on and on. He definitely. I replayed that several times. It was said hack. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to hack you to death. He did not say I'm going to hug you to death. No. Stefan talks about how the day before Kim went missing, Peter had talked to him about a website he visits that shows pictures of murder victims. And now it makes more sense why Peter refused to let the police search his computers. October 4th, police announced, based on the autopsy of the torso, Kim had been stabbed at least 15 times. Many of the wounds occurred in the genital region. Mm. That's some anger. I just, I mean, if he hadn't killed her in the dumbest way possible, <laughs> I, he would have been quite a serial killer. They also got access to Peter's hard drive where they find videos of women being tortured and murdered. But Peter says the drives don't belong to him. No, of course not. Oh, okay. Our bad. And on October 7th, the police announced they found a bag in the bay that contains Kim's clothes and a knife. And then they found her legs in bags and shortly after another bag containing her head. All of the bags had been weighed down with bits of metal. You just happen to have all that stuff sitting around? Yeah, just, you You know, the submarine. In case a stray cat gets on and poops inside the submarine, you have those bags to just pick it up. (laughs) Speaking of stray cat, that, when they're, like, posing for that picture and the woman's trying to hold the cat and it just chooses (laughs) violence. And and just takes off. It is, like, clawing to get away and then, like, runs. And I'm just like, what the fuck were you guys thinking? (laughs) Like, it was like they just grabbed this cat off the street. And surprise, there's no signs of fracture to the skull. Of course not. (laughs) Looks like someone's caught in another lie. So again, he changes the story. Of course. His news story is that she died from carbon monoxide poisoning, which, of course, it is a silent killer. (laughs) How did it not affect him? I thought heart attacks were like the silent killer. Carbon monoxide is literally (laughs) called the silent killer. Is that really? Weird Al's parents, yes. Oh, God. You didn't know that's how they died? No. Spoilers. That's not in that movie. (laughs) Oh, darn. And you'll find out why when you watch that movie. Uh, He does admit to cutting up her body, though. November 22nd and 29th, Kim's arms were found, so at least her family can have a full body. Like, that's... Yeah, I mean, I couldn't imagine having to, like, bury my loved one in bits and pieces. Yeah. January 12th, the police stopped searching for Kim in Peter's cell phones, which to this day have never been found. That's so weird. Yeah, why throw away the phones? I I just, what was his plan? I don't understand that. I, that's my whole thing is the man could have gotten away with it had he done it anywhere other than the submarine. (laughs) Especially when somebody saw her get in the submarine with you. You it's can't just, just escape out of it. No, like it's it's literally the dumb. It's like murdering someone inside your jail cell. There's no other. How Can are you, you gonna, imagine going up to the moon, John Glenn, like killing somebody, and then coming back and being like, oh, "Aliens no, got him." No, it was just me in the spaceship. Like what the fuck? <laughs> like for a man who thought he was so smart, he really was the dumbest person. It's so dumb. 
Because right away, everybody was like, nah, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, he really doesn't. Like, even his own friends, as soon as they heard, oh, he was found, but he was alone. That's weird. <laughs> like, just literally the dumbest crime scene place. Like, why would you choose there? Why? So I mean, obviously, because of the implications. <laughs> like, you're not just going to leave She's a submarine. not going to say no. On January 16th, Peter is finally charged with murder, indecent handling of a corpse, and sexual assault. Court system moves really fast in Denmark. I assume because it's rated as the third most pe- peaceful country, so they don't there's have not a lot much of court crime cases, yeah. to clog up the court system. <laughs> the crime occurred in August, and Peter goes on trial March 8th. That is super fast. <laughs> At the Copenhagen City Court where he faced two judges and two jurors. I don't know. I didn't want to look into how that worked. Two judges and only two jurors? I, how do you even I make a decision between it. two people? Like, this just sounds like it'll be complicated. Like, two people can barely decide what's for dinner. Well, it's four people. But why do you need two judges? Two judges, two jurors. Well, why do you need two jurors? <laughs> During the trial, when all the new information is coming out, the director is talking things over with the AI face girl. I don't remember if they even said her name in this. Just AI face girl. She is not handling it well because she knows she was the original intended victim. And the creepiest part about all of this is finding out all the planning he had been doing for a murder right under everybody's noses. And the text that he sent her. Yes. The morning of August 10th, he had been watching a video of a woman being tortured and decapitated, texted the AI girl to invite her to go on the sub with him the next day, and then just went to work with the director filming him like nothing was wrong. Okay, but can we talk about when she goes to jail? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when I'll she- get to it. Uh, yeah. I'll yeah, get to okay, it. good. The same day, they have footage of the saw hanging up on the back wall, and when they did filming on the 11th, when everybody was at the workshop trying to figure out where Peter was, the saw was missing from the wall. That gave me goosebumps. That's just... Yeah, like it was just like orange handle there, orange handle yeah. gone. Even on the 10th, when the director is trying to fix Peter's microphone, he was getting close to her face. I don't know what the fuck that was. It was creeping me out so much. If I had been that woman, I would have been so off-put. Like, it was really fucking weird. Yeah. They also show an interview from the 10th of him holding a metal pipe, I assume, this was what he used to weigh the torso down? He said he needed to fix something. They don't really get into specific why the metal pipe was important. He was definitely... The man's a psychopath. Yeah, it's you just all these... You can see in some of these interviews when he's talking, like, he seems like charming. His eyes just kind of yeah, go dead. Yeah, right, and then the mask slips, and he's just kind mm-hmm. of staring into space, and you're just like, what the fuck? It's definitely... But it's, it's just unnerving. all these little things that in hindsight are creepy as fuck. That's why I wish they would have showed all this stuff like beforehand and then go into. Right. Because when you're watching it, you're looking back, you're like, oh, OK, I see that. But maybe we wouldn't have seen it as creepy yeah. if we didn't know. Yeah. If you didn't straight up tell us, like, check this out. I would not have wanted to be in that courtroom. He doesn't admit to anything other than dismembering the body and the prosecution puts forth that he bound her, sexually assaulted her, tortured, and then ki- killed Kim. There were 37 marks all over her body where he stabbed or punctured her using a knife or sharpened screwdriver. Ugh. He's a fucking monster. I, I, again, don't know why he thought he would get away with it. Dude, his text messages to that woman, like, his that stories, would have been creepy enough. His stories never made sense. And he was covered in scratches on his arms and had her dried blood on his face when he was first taken in for questioning right after they found him. Oh, and he tried to blame Stefan for the videos on the hard drive. (laughs) Yeah, like, that's fucked up, man. Because he was the one who was, like, wanting to defend him. He was saying that someone that lived here or whatever could have done it. And he was like, which is clearly me. Man, that, like... Because the whole time he was the one who was like, this doesn't make sense, but how could he have done this? Like, try to make excuses. your own friend under the bus. April 25th, 2018, Peter is found guilty on all charges and sentenced to life imprisonment. This is where it gets a little weird. In Denmark, a life sentence is the most severe punishment, so they don't have death penalty. The average life of a life imprisonment sentence is 17 years, 
and you can request a pardon hearing after 12 years. <laughs> and even if you are pardoned, you serve a parole period of up to five years. An actual life sentence does exist, but it is only handed down when a person has previous history of committing serious crimes, or as in this case, a murder is considered particularly horrendous. From 2006 to 2018, only 14 people received life sentences, so that's about one a year. This movie ends with an interview of Peter talking about psychopath, and again, hindsight is 2012. 2020, he's describing himself. Right. Charismatic and, you know, just a very friendly and charming person who can make all these friends and then, you know, that mask slips and oops, like they've murdered someone. Yeah. The submarine was destroyed under the supervision of the Copenhagen Police Department. And now we go into... Uh, Can we talk about like when they were like burning his shit <laughs> well no when they were using the forklift thing to put the rocket into a dumpster yeah. <laughs> i was like that's really melodramatic they just used a forklift picked it up dropped it into the dumpster and i was like okay you're just gonna like expect the trash truck to pick that up and I then he comes like over with little... the forklift and like smushes into it <laughs> i liked his like... little work outfit that they just threw it in the fire yes his little jumpsuit so now we go into the other things that have happened since this documentary Peter appealed his sentence, but not the guilty verdict. (laughs) And on September 26, 2018, the High Court of Eastern Denmark upheld the sentence. August 2018, he was admitted to a hospital after being assaulted by another inmate. He was also in a relationship with a female prison guard. (laughs) That's not ethical. (laughs) I never understand that. This case was all over the news, like, It's not like you didn't know why this guy was in prison. Google exists. August 20, 2020, he fucking escaped from prison. What? (laughs) I didn't hear about this. He was found nearby in a residential neighborhood in position of a pistol-like object. Is it like a soap? I don't know. And was wearing a belt that could potentially contain explosives. And once experts determined it was a decoy, he was rearrested and given a 20-month 21 month prison sentence it wasn't added to his life sentence but it definitely doesn't look good if he tries to file for parole (laughs) i don't know what a pistol like object is you're not gonna add that that sentence onto his 17 years (laughs) of his life or whatever average come on because the average person lives 17 (laughs) years like i think the crazy part about all of this was he was married when the murder occurred. Yeah, I saw that he mentioned like something about like my yeah, wife. He mentioned some, my wife, yes. <laughs> my wife. But in a Danish accent. <laughs> yes, my wife. Uh, um, yeah, it was, like when he was talking about something like secrets or something. He was things that like my friends and my wife or whatever. Yeah. Know. Yeah. I thought that was weird. <laughs> like why you're married, man. Why are you taking all these women on your submarine? I know. He had been married since November 2011, and her identity has never been released by the media, and by the time the trial came around, she was long gone. As one would be. In December 2019, he married a 39-year-old activist who had been given political asylum in Finland due to threats from Russia. They divorced January 7th, 2022, possibly due to the death threats she received for marrying this monster. So, yeah, fuck him. Yeah, seriously. This man literally would have been a serial killer. Yes. Like, if he, he wasn't so fucking dumb. Yeah, if he wasn't so fucking dumb. He had a lot planned. <laughs> you could just tell. Well, and just his age is when he finally is like, all right, I'll do this. You had extra time to plan this out and you still fucked it up. Kim's friends and family founded the Kim Val Memorial Fund aimed at helping female reporters that cover stories of subcultural value. A memorial run took place on August 10th, 2018, where people all around the world ran or walked in her memory. In October 2017, she was posthumously nominated for Prix Europa's Outstanding Achievement Award for Journalist of the Year. Who won that if she didn't? <laughs> yeah, I feel like it would have been a would have been a criminal Hollow offense. victory. <laughs> yeah, like oh, I beat that one woman who was murdered by the guy on the submarine. And on November 9th, 2018, her parents published a book in her memory titled The Book of Kim Vell, When Words End. 
It was also released in English in 2020 titled A Silenced Voice. So yeah, I would recommend this documentary if you need something on in the background while you're cooking dinner. It's not a real sit down and... Yeah, I mean, other than like having to pay attention because of the dates on the screen or whatever, it was definitely not something you actually had to stare at to understand what's happening. It was just a lot of back and forth. But mostly just the talking is really the turning point. It's definitely worth a watch, but it's not too long. Um, If I had it my way, less focus on his interviews because... I much rather enjoyed hearing the thoughts from his friends and how they viewed him, like before it happened and after. It paints a much better picture to me of a wolf in sheep's clothing. I think that's yeah, no, definitely that's important. Because <laughs> I mean, if you if you watch it knowing who he is, because like... it's all these people who looked up to him and wanted to spend time with him and just not knowing what he did behind the scenes or the shit that he said. And yeah, thought. Hearing, hearing their sides just felt more important to me because he just loved to hear himself talk. And that says a great. lot coming from me. Yeah, <laughs> no, he was definitely, he was a narcissist and a psychopath. Yeah, you you could say that. You could. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely. I, I could and I would and I will. He was a fucking monster. So yeah, that's it for this week. It's kind of a short one. Yeah, because I think that was only like an hour and a half anyway. Yeah, it was it was a pretty brief. We saved like, you an hour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we will be back next week, hopefully covering season two of Wild Crime, Radio yeah. Yosemite. <laughs> Are you gonna watch it? I am. It is four episodes, but <laughs> I have all the time on my hands. If I had known that I was supposed to watch it last week, <laughs> I would have watched it instead of watching two and a half seasons of Manifest. <laughs> so mad you didn't even watch the crown (laughs) i know i'm mad at myself i didn't watch the crown (laughs) i just like it's it's kind of like when you have something really good and you don't want to eat it all like because you're just like scared of when it's gone kind of thing and i don't know (laughs) like i i don't want to watch the crown because when i'm done it's over (laughs) oh i watched the whole thing tuesday (laughs) no i'm definitely gonna like binge watch it which is what's so depressing i think i didn't i tell you like it was better than Unsolved Mysteries because Unsolved Mysteries like, I haven't watched. Sucked. I haven't watched the last three episodes because no, I, I was just either. so uninterested. Yeah, like the the other cases were terrible. So I was like, okay, well, I'll watch The Crown see if this is. Maybe they just had a lull. Do you know what we should cover? Even though it's not a documentary, that The Crown season five. <laughs> yes, yes, we will cover The Crown season five. No, but first, we have to cover seasons one through four. <laughs> Not three. Don't ask us why. <laughs> no, I was going to say that um, the cave rescue video, the movie with... Um, is that the one where Elon Musk called the rescuer a pedophile? Is Did it? Did you not hear about that? No, now I have to find out that. <laughs> and he now owns my favorite website, Twitter. You and your tweets. I do love my tweets. You don't have to look it up right this second. We could say goodbye. Okay, sorry. I had to look it up because I was like, oh, that's is it fucked the same up. One? Is it the same one? Well, I guess he's talking about like the actual cave rescuer, not the movie. No, yeah, it was the actual cave rescuer when it was happening. That is crazy. <laughs> the movie, though, I didn't think that I would like it because it's not like an actual documentary. Oh, so it's not a documentary? It's not a documentary. It's like an actual, like, it's a movie, but very, like, realistic of what's happening or what they did or whatever. Okay. I didn't know that they put the kids to sleep. They drug the kids. Is that why you called them pedophile? I didn't know that. And so, like, watching it, because, like, it's like, oh, my God, you have to watch it. It's so good. And I was like, oh, it sounds so boring. And then I, like, started watching it, and I was like, oh, my God, this is so good. Like, it is really good. There's a bunch of documentaries I saw go up. that I'm like, yeah, we need to cover this, need to cover this. And I'm so mad because I was like, oh, it's not really a documentary. But... I mean, it's, you know, based on an actual true happening, and there is a documentary about it, but I don't think it's as good as this movie. Okay, I'll look into it. But anyway. I know there's a lot coming out right now that we need to go over. That are actually documentaries. Yes. yes. <laughs> Fine. But we will hopefully be back next week. We will definitely be hopefully. back next week. It is flu season. God. You already got one kid sick, so. 
now literally like Thursday. She was like, I feel fine. Check me again. I'm like, dude, this isn't like a COVID test where I can just like <laughs> test you repeatedly. Like, the doctor said you're sick and you can't. And she's like, no, I'm fine. Okay. You're fine then. Go to school. Oh, no. I think it's coming back. I know. Three whole days off of school, and she was only sick for half of a day of one of them. <laughs> That's the worst. It was like two and a half days of her just being normal eight-year-old. You could have drugged her. <sighs> Wish I had. <laughs> okay, we'll be back next week. Thank you for listening. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Talk to Me. The opening music is by Twisterium. For comments or suggestions, we can be reached by email at doctomepod at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter at doctomepod and find a link to our Facebook group in the show notes. Thank you.